<coughs> so, yeah, so thank you uh, very much again for the invitation and, and also thank, thanks to everyone for, for coming this afternoon. Yeah, I'm Erich Berger and I'm working for the BioArt Society together with my colleagues Birita Puchto, Lisa Kalkowski, Mila Mila Snorri and Ginietta Vasi. And today I will introduce the work of the BioArt Society and then together with Björn, as we said, go a bit deeper into what we are doing. Um, and as an example, we take the recent field notes, field laboratory in PCR, and that will come a little bit later. And yeah, we titled our presentation, Navigating the Fine Madness of Art and Science. And this term, fine madness, actually comes from one of our collaborators. And according to her, this fine madness refers to the manic grandiosity, visionary expansiveness, and unbridled euphoria abundant among artists. But uh, before I go a little bit further into bioart society, let's kind of uh, have a brief kind of look at what bioart actually could be. Um, bioart emerged as an artistic field during the last couple of decades with the onset of life sciences and its novel possibilities to manipulate life on a level of the DNA. And uh, the first artists tried to get access to biological laboratories and to work with these new materials. And then the artist studios themselves turned into sort of biological laboratories with microscopes and incubators and artists working with living organisms. And the BioArt Society took this uh, original concept and developed it further by also taking into account um, the environment. Because though this new life is produced in laboratories, the environment at large will eventually be impacted by it, intentionally or unintentionally. Already now, we have GMO in our foods, maybe not in, in every uh, uh, nation. In some regions of the world, um, just think about the attempts to bring back lost species, also like the extinction with the woolly mammoth. And so biological arts are interested in general in what is life and what life can do. And I would say that it is the question about the contemporary biological condition. And what you see here is an artwork by uh, artist Anta Vokare, and he's actually a pioneer of bioarts in Finland. And very early on, he already used microbes and fungi, like in this sculpture here, as his artistic material. So the Bioart Society itself was established in 2008 at the Kilpisjärvi Biological Station. And we try to support and facilitate transdisciplinary activities around art and natural sciences with a focus on ecology, biology, and the life sciences. And transdisciplinarity, because as an organization, one of our main challenges is to enable collaboration between practitioners with a multitude of approaches, from strict academia to freewheeling artistic ways of working. And we have about 140 members from different disciplines, about 70% are artists and then also scientists from other disciplines. And we work strongly with project-based collaborations in Finland and also internationally with individual artists, scientists, other art organizations and universities in programs which sometimes last several years. And in Helsinki, we run since 2018 a multifunctional project space called SOLU, where we organize exhibitions, workshops, and other activities uh, on roughly 140 square meters. And in the image, you can see the first exhibition which we had in, in SOLU space with Pia Lindman. And on the poster, you can see actually an outline of our space. Uh, here is an image of the Atmospheric Encounters exhibition by the HUB group. HUB stands for High Altitude Bioprospecting Group. 
And that was the last exhibition we had here in, in Solu. And uh, it is a transdisciplinary group, which was part of Field Notes, where we'll come back to and talk more about what that is. That was in 2019, this event, but this was basically now last year, 2021. And this exhibition is an outcome of field work, which was done uh, in our um, collaboration partner in Kilpisjärvi and was a co-production also with Birmingham Open Media, a similar organization than ours. Then I said, we also do workshops. Here is an example of the bioprospecting workshop where we learn together how to collect, cultivate and identify bacteria. You can also see that there is this kind of um, here, uh, this kind of uh, lab equipment. This is a device which uh, uh, came out of do-it-yourself uh, production. So we really kind of try to use these community approaches and not only uh, teach uh, kind of ways to do it, but also kind of try to, to engage in, in the production of those materials which we then use in, in our experiments. Then besides exhibitions and workshops at the space, we also run frequent seminar and talk programs. And uh, uh, here the seminar we organized for the book launch of our latest publication, Art as We Don't Know It, which was published in 2020 by Auto Arts Books. And we made this book for our 10 years anniversary. But instead of looking back on what we did, we used the book to explore topics which might lay ahead of us. And you can also download a free PDF copy via our, via our website uh, of this book, but also of other publications we did previously. Yeah, and, but we also organize other events like concerts and performances uh, in our space and offer it also to individuals or organizations in need for an event space if Solo is available. And like for everyone, also for us, the pandemic brought a lot of changes into the way we are working. And so during 2020, we also learned to produce online uh, content and have been quite successful with it, actually. And while the pandemic was quite hard on everyone, it forced us to rethink our activities and also showed us new possibilities of working. Here we can see an image of the Splice exhibition we did for the Olu Museum of Art in 2017. And as I already mentioned, we work a lot with collaborations in Finland and abroad. And another example uh, is the exhibition Crisscrossing Ecologies, which is at the moment on display at the uh, Taide Halle in Seinäjoki. And in this exhibition, we present six works by artists based in Finland and abroad. And the exhibition was originally developed for the Anantor Talo in Helsinki with the goal to present contemporary questions for the whole family without compromising on the arts. And so we tried to find artworks which not only address those kind of specificities with their concept, but where those questions are also embodied in the processes and in the materials used by the artists. And I would like to invite you to go and visit the show if you are in the vicinity of Senga Yoki. Uh, here another example of a collaboration with Heureka in Vanta. What you can see in the image is a performance of Finland-based sound artist Antje Kaye with a self-synthesizer, which is built by artists Galpin Ari and Nathan Thompson from Australia. And what makes this machine so special is that it is run from a living neural network made from the skin cells of the artists. And during the performance, the neural network learns from the music of its co-performer and then responds musically. And the outcome is a peculiar and fascinating interplay, a dialogue between the musician and the machine. Um, as another example, or last one for the exhibitions, the Hybrid Matters at Forum Box in 2016, which was an outcome of a two years Nordic collaboration called Hybrid Matters. And it is an it is exemplary 
for many of the collaborations which followed as it combines artistic research, artwork production, workshops, publications and other activities. And since then, we have been partnering in many Creative Europe and Nordic projects. Um, this way of working is also considerable contributes actually to our budgets. And when we want to work with biotechnologies, common in microbiology, like gene editing, then by law, we need to go into a Biosafety 1 certified laboratory. Uh, fortunately, there are now already two laboratories close to us at Aalto University, the one Biophilia, the other one Biogarage, and both are open for working with artists and other practitioners. This and the next image, which will come uh, from the Mary CRISPR workshop series, and CRISPR refers to a range of very novel gene editing systems. While some welcome CRISPR as a revolution, others urge for a worldwide moratorium, and especially um, when it comes to human germline modification. And particularly controversial uh, is the possibility which it gives to intervene in the evolution of organisms. And this is what we saw, for example, in 2018 with the birth of Lulu and Nana in China, two babies which were gene edited with the CRISPR method. Yeah, artists alone will not save the world, I think, but we can play an important role in participating in this kind of critical thinking process, which is necessary to understand the wider implications of such technologies. And we see our role with the BioArt Society in uh, giving artists the possibility to familiarize themselves with these technologies so they are able to create informed cultural responses. A long-term collaborator of the BioArt Society is the Kilpisjärvi Biological Station, where we run the Ask Bioarctica Art and Science program. And uh, since 2009, I estimate that more than 400 artists from Finland and abroad have been working at the station in a diverse program of residencies, specific workshops, and also the field notes program. Important here is that we aim to work with what is at hand, the landscape, the flora, the fauna, the climate, or the geology, and that to be the catalyst for our questions and develop a notion of artistic fieldwork, which is specific to a place and cannot be done elsewhere. As with the biological station, our program and its activities are carried out on Sami land. And so we consider ourselves also guests in Sapmi. We are working frequently with Sami people in the area or our residency artists do so via their own contacts. And our aim is to work respectful and to deepen our knowledge about the land and its people. Because it is a field station, it is actually very easy for artists to integrate and the spaces are built to be shared among many different researchers. And so artists can work along everyone else. And so Ask Bioarctica is really an important part of the BioArt Society and the specificities of how we are working. And so for the rest of our presentation, we will remain now in Kilpisjärvi and the work we are doing there. Yeah. yeah, okay. I think uh, it's my turn now. So we can switch the screen. Okay. Okay, good. I think that the desktop, yeah. Okay, so. <clears throat> The question is now how, can, how I came to the BioArt Society, and uh, I will simplify the story a little bit. Uh, one important event definitely was um, when I met Ante Bokabe in a public event in, in Helsinki at some point. And the funny thing is, um, at that event, I think it was a round table or something, at some point he showed a fossil. And uh, it was a fossil like this one. Oops. 
Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, this, uh, like this fossil, and I was totally perplexed. It struck by, by fascination. I thought, what is this? How can it doesn't look very, very, uh, probably very big or very special. But for me, it was really something special because I use it in my, I use this type of fossil, which is called Treptichnus, a trace fossil, in my lectures at the university at master's level. And there I talk about the history of life. And I have sometimes usually something like this show a slide about, especially about this type of trace fossil. Now you can see in this slide on the upper left, you can see some, some drawings of it on the upper right, some examples from somewhere in the world. Actually, these fossils can be, find in, can be found in several places in the world. And in the lower part, there is an explanation how this fossil is produced by priapolite worms and they dig in the earth and they produce these traces. And now the special thing is that these fossils, really, I never in my own life, I never in my life saw a real fossil of those things. That's why I was so perplexed. It's quite famous because it occurs in a time interval which is called Precambrian Cumbrian boundary, actually at the very earliest part of the Cumbrian time. And to that, I have to explain a little bit what it means, Cumbrian. Geologists and paleontologists uh, subdivide the history of life in epochs and periods and areas. So we don't talk usually about the millions of years. We have these names for different intervals. And a few important names are here. The Phanerozoic Aeon, and that's the time on Earth since uh, we have animals on Earth. Uh, and then we have all these periods here. And now when you look at the lower, maybe I can show point here, the Cumbrian and the Ediacaran boundary, it's just at the beginning of the animals. And uh, some people may know this time interval, it's called the Cumbrian explosion. And uh, when we talk about the Cumbrian explosion, uh, this was a short time interval in the history of life. When in really in a few million years, maybe 10 million years, all the animals, the large groups of animals appears really rapidly. It was a huge step in evolution. Before the Cumbrian, we had only these strange organisms, which looked really like these fronds or feather-like things. And afterward, we had really animals, which we are uh, animals that we are familiar more or less uh, like today. Yeah. And uh, another picture which shows the big difference between these time intervals, the time interval with animals and without animals is this. People usually talk about this, the time before the arrival of animals as the, yeah, you could say the paradise of the Archidiacaran. And, and then we had this Cumbrian explosion and the world looked really different. And one aspect which was really important, uh, by that time and still is extremely important is what makes a, what makes an animal in an animal you can see in the upper part and the lower part you see in the lower part you see simple animals in the upper part you see more complex animals and the more complex animals they have a digestive tract with a mouth and an anus and they move actively so they search for food and they actively change their environment really in a different way. And one different way how they change their, their world or our world today, or we change our world is by searching for food, we dig in the mud and in the earth. And um, the paleontologists and geologists, they call this the Cumbrian agronomic revolution or the Cumbrian substrate revolution. And what happened with the arrival of animal, they, they digged into the uh, sea bottom and they oxygenized it and they made it by this a new habitat. And now I have to come back to Treptichnus and Treptichnus basically lived just at the very beginning of the animals. It's not in this picture depicted, maybe this is a trace of, of Treptichnus. So that's why it is so fascinating for me. And now I, I totally wondered why, where did, uh, did uh, Andrew found this fossil? Uh, no geologist, I know at least from Finland ever came across this. So it was totally unknown that you could find these kind of things in Finland. And now I can give to, to, to Erich and he can tell the story sure. how they discovered. My turn again. Yeah. So. 
So sorry, this didn't start now. I have to stop sharing again. Yeah, we have to, to, to learn a little bit how, how the switch goes. Oh, that's just uh, we will do it a couple of times. What happens when you <laughs> when you do this? Yeah. So but now it works. <coughs> what? Yeah. Yeah, as Pjorn mentioned, this encounter of, of Pjorn and Antaro and the and the fossil was actually preceded by a, a certain event of a series which we producing Kilpis Yavi, which is called Field Notes. And we organized it in an approximate biennial rhythm at the, at the station. And you can see here the, the, on the slides the, the dates and, and the names uh, of, uh, of those uh, events. And they are basically, um, for, from, for most of the time, they are like one week intense field uh, laboratories, which, uh, which have an umbrella topic, like for example, deep time, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. And then we are, we are looking or we inviting uh, five hosts, five kind of what we think of as specialists, which we ask to, to ask a specific question under this umbrella topic. And then, um, we make an open call and internationally ask people to sign up for a group which is hosted by one of those hosts. And the idea would be that uh, these people who sign up and who come um, are able to work together with the host to kind of in, into this question, maybe not necessarily to answer it, but to, to maybe make it more precise or find things out around it. So it is basically then about 40 people which are in Kilpis together working very intensely. And what we see here is uh, one of those groups. Uh, and this is now again, the high altitude bioprospecting group. We are at the very beginning, I showed you the exhibition uh, which happened last fall in Solo. And they basically did in 2019 their field work here. And here's basically this contraption, this helium field balloon, which is uh, sent up into the sky to collect microorganisms which, living in the, which are living in the air. And um, about 50% of the, of the participant we try to keep take care uh, from abroad and 50% approximately from Finland so that we are able to kind of guarantee uh, an, an exchange, uh, also like a cultural exchange. And that um, some people who go there have already uh, knowledge about the land and, and about the environment so that there is really a lot of expertise uh, from, from different sectors there. And on the, on the image, you see a group uh, which was working in 2013 on a very peculiar site in Kilpisjärvi. This is the plane crash site of a Junkers aeroplane from 1945, which crashed, crashed here in mountainside of Sana. And uh, the peculiarity of the place is actually, as you can see, it looks quite fresh, but it is actually more than 70 years ago. And what they did here was they were interested what lives actually in that soil, which is still looking quite burned and, and toxic. Um, but overall questions which we have, I will present three of them, uh, which we want to work through with field notes is basically what kind of data, what kind of information and experience remains outside of the scope of the scientific research, because we are at the Kilpisjärvi Biological Research Station, which is foremost for science. 
And how can this be turned into knowledge or experience through artistic methods? So we come there to develop a notion of artistic fieldwork. And because the field is the site of the basic research and it shapes our understanding of the world, but it also shows how we understand and approach the world when going into the unknown territory and also out of our comfort zones. So fieldwork is locally in the field and about the field cannot be done elsewhere. And it is not opposite to theoretical work or then uh, later maybe when we think about artists also to kind of exhibition work or other forms of artistic publishing, but it is a crucial component of it. On the image, you see uh, another happening at one of the field notes events is that we were eating a meteorite, which was filed down and suspended in, in uh, Rachka. Here is an environmental sample collected uh, during the work. And here again, how to apply artistic practices to specific situations and how to be alert of practices and approaches which emerged in such a situation. And for that, we have a, a very special instrument uh, in the in field notes, which is actually an own group and it's called the second order group. And the, the research or the field of research, the field work for the second order group is not in the environment, but are the other groups. So it is basically a, a, a group of artists observing artists doing art, if you want to, to uh, name it like that. And it basically is for us an instrument to see and learn what we are doing. Because it is really then critical to this last question also, like how can the artistic, the scientific, the cultural, the social, the political be a catalyst for shared questions in the field. But let me now come back to the trace fossil again, because as I said already, one important aspect to field notes is to connect it to the locality and to let the environment be a catalyst for our work and our questions. And When we, we, we have been already, uh, like we, we, we are working since 2009 actually at the station and, it, and um, over the years you kind of learn what is at the station and what are in the surroundings and kind of three things which I present here on this slide uh, really stuck to my mind. One is on the background you see the site of an ammunition depot explosion from 1912, uh, when the when the when the war, uh, the Finnish war was uh, was in the Kilpisjärvi area, and the site is more than 100 years old. But again, it looks like uh, it would have been just maybe a decade ago. It really takes a long, long time for the. Uh, for the environment there to, to return into a kind of a, a natural state. Uh, another object we found in the kind of hidden collection of the, of the station was this arrowhead from the Kilpisjärvi area. It is basically around 5,000 years old and is made of slate. And in this slate and in this type of rock, we found another thing at the station, this piece of trace fossils. And with it came the, the description that this was not found in Kilpisjärvi, because in Kilpisjärvi, in the, in the area around uh, Sana, there were not the conditions for, for trace fossils to, to build. But that this piece is from further away, like, 30, 40 kilometers towards the, the Halti uh, mountain. So what we all of a sudden had were these kind of three objects which represented human impact, but at the same time also in the same materiality uh, combined the first 
human artistic expression, the first craft, but also the first kind of um, traces of life. And so we, we turned this kind of vague idea into field notes deep time, uh, which was one of these kind of um, field laboratories in 2013 for five different groups to work into different questions of that. And one of the groups was led by Antaro Kare. And together with Antaro, our, one of our missions was basically to find out more about these trace fossils. And so we looked at the geological map of Kilpisjavi, and then we saw that is, we found this blue line. And this blue line is the sediment layer which uh, has the sediments of the Dividarian group. That's what it, what the sediment layer is called. And uh, yeah, we just basically followed it and looked for an outcrop where these, where these rocks come to the surface because most of the time they are just uh, covered by the moraine. And then here, here is the biological station. Here is Kilpisjavi. This is the Sana mountain. And here, just between basically the, the Lake Sana, and then when it goes down, we found a place which we now call the Valley of Time. Uh, that was actually coined by Taru Elfing, who was uh, speaking earlier in this series, where we then found those type of traces. And one of those traces then found its way to Pjörn. And this is basically how the circle now yeah. closes. The story. Yeah. Now I come back with my screen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. This one. Yeah. And now I can talk a little bit about a uh, nice video. Oh, anyway, I come here too. And now I talk, will talk a little bit about my, yeah, I will talk a little bit about my motivation to do, uh, yeah, to, to, to go there in the field and also to check for the fossils. Yeah? And I have to talk a little bit about my background, what, what I carry when I go there. And this is geology basically. And this is what I will explain now. Uh, I should start here with the... So, yeah, and to explain this, let's take a look where Kilpisjärvi is. And Kilpisjärvi is in the north of Scandinavia. And this mountain range here, this long mountain range is called the Scandinavian mountains, you probably all know, but geologists call them also Caledonian mountains. And I will explain you what this is now, or at least how I learned what it is, yeah? So, and also I will tell a little bit why I think is Kiltisjärvi so special. And this is a map, a geological map of Finland and all these pale colors here, these light colors, this is the usual Finnish one. This is something which is really not interesting for a, geo for a paleontologist like me. And that why, that's why it's also a very strange story that I ended up in Finland because there are so few places where you can really find fossils. But there are obviously in the very northern tip of, um, of Finland, a few places where you can find fossils. And this is in the Kilpisjärvi area. And actually this area was mapped um, geologically really in detail first in the 1940s by a Toku uh, geology professor. He has a German name, but he was a Finnish. But he followed in 1942, this is from a paper from 1942, he followed the footsteps of the army. I think that the Germans were this by that time. And he mapped, he mapped for ores and prospecting. They looked for, for, special, for special minerals or for special uh, metals or whatever. And they found, this is actually exactly this blue layer that we found on that modern map. He mapped this area because it was special. It shows these strange shales and it also makes a step in the landscape. And uh, Zana is only one place where you can see this step in the landscape. It's a little bit like a cliff. Yeah? You have on the top some rocks which are very hard, 
and below that are these <coughs> shales that contain the fossils. And then on the basement, what is called here P, these are rocks which are very usual in Finland. And when I explain this very simp simply, on the top you have hard sandstones, or actually they are quartzites. They form like a cap, basically, like a sugar cap. And below that cake, there is the, 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 the foam, the, the whatever, the, the soft pieces, and then there is the Finnish hard rock, the granites and the gneisses. And there's a big age difference between these. These gneisses are roughly 1,000 million years old, and the shales are only 500 million years old, and the sandstones may be 480 or 490 million years old. So something here between that time and that time, something happened. And then on the, when you go on the top of the Zana and, and look at this, this, this area here, you see a lot of disturbance, tectonic disturbance. Very strange signs of movements, of tectonic movements. And geologists early understood this as something which is a mountain forming event. And uh, this is a modern reconstruction of this mo mountain forming event. It shows them cross sections from northwest to southeast and the map. And in that map, uh, everything which is colored are the Caledonian Mountains. And you can see here, I think it's, it's visible, you can see that this, these Caledonian Mountains are a big overthrust of rocks, which were pushed from the west toward the east, toward Finland and Sweden. And this area here, which is the easternmost part, is called the Caledonian Front by geologists. And uh, Kilpisjärvi, actually it's here, is just, just at this Caledonian Front. And to understand this mountain forming event, uh, it is good to look at a map, modern map of Europe. Uh, Geophysicists, they discovered at one point um, that we have, we live in Finland somehow in the center of an old continent and that continent is called Baltica. And here you see the borders of Baltica, modern borders of Baltica. It runs here from you know, through, through the White Sea, goes up north of Norway and then it goes through Denmark, Polish border down Black Sea and then goes up to the Ural. So this was this huge, this, this huge old continent. And when we now go back to the time when these mountains form, these Caledonian mountains, a reconstruction looks like that. The dark part here are the Caledonian mountains and they reach actually from where we have Kilpisjärvi here, down through uh, Scotland, um, through the Normandy and Newfoundland up down to New York. And this was one big continent, the old red continent it's called. And Klippisjärvi by that time was really at the equator, but that was the event when the mountains formed. We have to go back to the, to the time when the, when the trace fossils lived or when the traces uh, forming organisms lived. And uh, so we have to step back a little bit. So this then is a world map of that time of this mountain forming. Kiltis here again, close to the equator, this big continent here. And um, now we have to go back in time to 500 million years to the Cambrian explosion time. And uh, here are a few pictures, world maps, 480 million years this on the left side, that's the oldest, 440 million years, that's the youngest in that picture. And you can see here when you go from the back in time, uh, there was once an ocean in between Sweden, Norway, and Greenland, and the US, and North America. And that o ocean closed in that time, which we call Ordovician, within, let's say, 40 million years. And that was this mountain forming event. But we have to go back to the Cambrian time. And in the Cambrian, um, actually Kilpis here, we was here really close to the South Pole, maybe in a place where is now Antarctica. Um, but there was a different climate by that time. So this is a reconstruction. People know that. And I, I tell you this because this is what my background is. So my knowledge, how when I think about these rocks and, and place Kilpis Yavi, I have this in mind. And this is a paleogeographic reconstruction, how 
the land and the sea was distributed during the time when the trace fossil formed. So there is some kind of, oops, there is some kind of knowledge, but as you can see, this map is really like, I would say very, very um, yeah, schematic. And the, the yellow coastline looks really like very similar everywhere. So there, there is not much knowledge actually. It, it, there's a lot of fantasy in this involved. And, and, and that's why I'm also very much interested geologically and in that scientific point to know more about the sediments in Kilpisjärvi and to go back and to understand a little bit more than uh, what really happened in this place 500 million years ago. So and now I have here a list of all my uh, scientific questions or the questions which, which I would come to Kilpisjärvi. And there are these questions are, for instance, are there outcrops with more fossils and successions of rocks? Can we find better things? What is the diversity of the trace fossil assemblage? Which animals produce those traces if we find more? What so, do uh, animals do? And then is there a temporal succession? Did there, was there some evolution going on? How did the original marine environment look like? And what is the exact age of this fossil? So actually I, I thought, let's find out more. But you know, when I go, and this comes now to, to our collaboration, when I go in the field, in a, in a landscape like this, in such a vast, in my eyes, beautiful, huge landscape, and in such a place, which is also very strange for me, I, my, my, my work, I feel really uncomfortable often. And it feels really often very, uh, like I miss the point. I often ask what I'm doing here. Is this really the right way how I approach this landscape? And is collecting fossils really the right, right way to approach and to go there? So there are lots of questions and I often feel not very, like I like it, but I, I feel a sense of that's not, not the only way. It's, it's much to reduce to just to look for fossils in these places and to understand the geology, although it's interesting. So, and that's why uh, I, I really searched for, at some point, for collaboration with, with, with people who have different perspectives on that landscape and are interested in the fossils. Yeah, and now we switch back to Iris. Right. Okay. Can I stop you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now as we we're hearing about Pjörn's kind of scientific motivations, but also about his kind of uh, challenges as scientists when doing this work. It would be, of course, also interesting. Why would it be something for artists to work with him or with geology as such? So during this field notes deep time, we got specifically aware of what one could say is a dichotomy between human time perception and the time in those biological, environmental, and geological processes, which we as humans are part of. And I think that this dichotomy arises, for example, in the present, especially as we as individuals are challenged to engage in endeavors and, and measures to secure a human future, which we will not be part of, and for humans, which we will never know. We also became aware that the discussion about such issues quickly become quite anthropocentric because the scales we use to think about the world are made to suit us humans. And therefore, processes running on scales beyond our capabilities can easily go unnoticed or even ignored. And with the Anthropocene discourse, we also realized that human impact entered planetary time, that we are now intentionally and unintentionally after the alter the Earth's system itself, and that this change 
will alter the planet for a very long time on a scale which will be registered in the geological records. So if we ask ourselves, what do we leave behind on such a global and geological scale, then it is interesting, of course, to look into what happened before. Such knowledge and understanding of the past on a cultural level could assist us to act in the present for a livable future, which we will not be part of and for humans or other creatures, which we will never know, like I mentioned before. For example, in Finland, uh, we are the first nuclear nation which decided to build a permanent nuclear waste storage facility. And the repository is called Onkalo. I think many of you know about it. It means hidden place. And it is located in the Eurajoki municipality of the Finnish west coast. It's very close also to the reactor buildings of the Olkiluoto nuclear power plant. And around the year 2120, at least I will not be alive then anymore, the final encapsulation and burial of Onkalo will take place. And then the access tunnels will be backfilled and sealed and multiple barriers are said to keep the waste away from groundwater and the surface, at least for the next 100,000 years. So Finland also made the decision that the information about Onkalo needs to be maintained, but did not define how to do this. So we have an engineering project, apparently lasting for 100,000 years. And we have also like an information traveling system, which should be intact for that time as well. While it is possible probably to engineer such a facility in the deep bedrock, it is totally unclear what will happen during this 100,000 years on the surface. Multiple ice ages coming and going will erase all memories from the surface and looking back into human history and the current state of affairs, affairs it is also difficult to imagine that a continuous civilization will be aware of what kind of load was sent into the deep future. So while deep time essentially means geological time, Earth history basically from its beginning as a molten ball of matter until the present, the deep futures I mentioned do not exist yet. They are a thought vehicle to speculate within the possibility space of a future Earth. And they are unfolding during the long time our planet has still ahead. And so it is difficult to imagine who or what it is which will need to deal with the remnants of the presence like Onkalo in a deep future. Among many thoughts, uh, it triggers certainly questions about intergenerational justice and our responsibility, not only for the present, but also for what comes after us. And I think that this example of Onkalo shows us the necessity to make ourselves as a society familiar with questions of times and scales. In general, I think one can locate an increase of artists working with ecological issues, the climate crisis, and issues of social and racial injustice, which are enablers of a system of extraction and exploitation. And coming with this, is a growing interest in matters of knowledge and the examination of the real. We can see, for example, that the interaction of art with science is becoming a popular subject, but also I think that, for example, the crisis of our civil society and its institutions feed into this. For example, the Sandberg Institute in the Netherlands uh, was running a two-year uh, master course, which just now got extended for another two years with the name F for Facts. And they write, at a time when facts are increasingly framed as fantasy and fiction is often presented as truth, F for Fact aims to develop narratives for the present by looking at past and future representations of reality through an artistic lens. And I think that what is important here is that it is not about the arts defending a postulated truth, but to explore the depth of reality. And by depth, I mean also to go beyond that which we can experience or comprehend with our own bodies and sensorial capabilities. 
Benjamin Bratton calls that, for example, the scope of the real. Geologist uh, Marcia Fjernerud, for example, introduces the concept of timefulness to point out that we should adapt a polytemporal worldview to help us develop a planetary thinking and to understand and act in the world on human scale might appear as a common sense at first, but we need to develop an awareness that many of the scales in use are not given by the world, but have been decided on by someone. They are in themselves reflecting hierarchies and hegemonies, and as such are actually in the domain of the political. And the politics of scale is a term which was coined by Neil Smith. And he coined it to attend to the processes through which scales are constructed and contested. And Smith says that geographical scale is political precisely because it is the technology according to which events and people are quite literally contained in space. Alternatively, scale demarcates the space or spaces people take up or make for themselves. In scale, therefore, are distilled the oppressive and the emancipatory possibilities of space, its deadness, but also its life. And while Smith is examining geographical space, we can see with what Breton or Pjörner would say that a more general evaluation of scale is of interest. And the previous examples of Onkalo or the climate crisis demonstrate very well also on how to possibly continue from Neil Smith when we expand his politics of scale from geographical space with time. And we could introduce something like a geotemporal scale and say that it is political precisely because analog to the geographical scale, it demarcates the space over time which future humans or other entities are able to take up or make space for themselves. And well, it is now that we draw these temporalities uh, which future generations have to deal with. And I believe that artists are able to participate in this process of producing awareness about such issues and to re reveal and illuminate this social, political and cultural context that brought them into being. And I think that this is somehow serving as a background for their work we are doing in Kilpisjärvi and how we also engaging with the deep time of the trace fossils. Pure. Yeah. So first I turn the video on. I think we have got it the last time. Yeah. This is something like a very already very reduced, like a starting point where we met. Yeah. So these are basically the premises or the the basics when we when we met and when we thought these are really good good points to start a collaboration and to start a project and to think about what to do uh, with our ideas and with our yeah, questions and motivations and how to come together and it was not so easy um, um, to to find a framework I think we have quite a lot of time now. Do we? To, yeah. Well, that is good, and we so have we a good discussion then later. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah, so it was, um, where did I stop? Um, at, the, at this starting point, but to, to frame it, yeah. So it's not so easy to find a way how to work together and how to get funding and find the time and what to do then, what are, could be products uh, or what could be an outcome with our all our different thinking also. Yeah? There should we, should we end up then somewhere with some product, with some ready idea or whatever. So it was really, everything was quite, quite open at the beginning. And uh, finally we, Erich, thought that um, 
this field notes format was quite a good starting point to, to continue um, and to work specifically on traces and to use mm -hmm. traces as a way to and approach the landscape or the land. Yeah, yeah, like feed notes also because of that, because uh, as you were saying, like uh, what are the results, what are the outcomes? For us, feed notes is something which is really uh, specifically designed to have during the time of the field work no outcome. It's basically really going there, being prepared to some extent, um, having this kind of set of um, things one wants to look at, but then uh, even there is this idea of an artist that when they go to a residency, they need to produce an artwork, but mm. this is basically exactly not what we what we want to do. And so field notes for, for me was a, a free enough format mm. that we could actually find out those kind of, uh, or work also to, through the challenge of working together at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I had by that, by the beginning, I must say already, there's still the, the idea in mind, when I ask somewhere for funding, it needs, I need to have like a research question, which is well framed. And I also need at some point, I need a hypothesis and I need at the end some outcome and some conclusion. So, and this is really something I must say already now that that was a big challenge for me at the beginning when we went into the field, but that uh, is already a step forward because we started then with the field work as a frame. And um, we, I can start now sharing the screen again. Okay. Yeah, one, one should probably also say that, uh, that here one can see really the differences also maybe between art and science as a practice that mm -hmm. you are very limited in how you are able to pose your research question. Mm -hmm. Because it, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't have had a research question, so to speak, when we started, but maybe in its kind of holistic uh, approach, it would not have kind of succeeded the scientific standard because it was very open mm -hmm. and it also included uh, a very different view of what the traces could lead to. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we were not even sure if we would find traces. And that was okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but then in August last year, we were able to, to announce it. Yeah. So this was then on the website of the Bioart Society and the blog and also connected to another project where we don't talk about this. Oh, we could maybe. briefly mention it now as we have a little bit of time. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was connected to a, to a project which is called Archive, obviously, where the BioArt Society is carrying out <clears throat> a couple of um, case studies to generate material for good practices. And that also means actually that uh, you will soon be able to, to download uh, some of the material which we produced and uh, you can uh, then kind of get an understanding not only about what we did there, about the science and about the artistic component, but also like how to organize such an event and what to, what to take care of, basically. And it helped us also to give some, this, this way how we frame that, to give some structure to, to our field notes, I would mm -hmm. say. Uh, but, we, but before we talk about this, mm, during the summer we started to, to, to com compile a team or to, 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 to find people who would, would make a good mix and an interesting, interesting group. And uh, this is now the group we, we brought together. Very wild mix of people, I must say. I start in the upper left. In the upper left, this is Judith van der Elst. She is uh, from the Netherlands and anthropologist, also works as an artist. And uh, she has, I think, also an archeology span background. Uh, Jakob Pesonen, uh, she is a Finnish artist, architect, 
I thought curator, that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. also, yeah. And then Lena, Lena Valkiapi, she lives in very close 60 kilometers of Tilpisjärvi uh, since many, many years. Um, her husband is a reindeer herder, so lots of her practice, daily practice, daily work is um, reindeer herding. She is our local contact, if you so will. Yeah, she's also the, the mentor of the Aspio Arctica residency. So we are working with her since many years. And she is uh, by training, by training and also by practice, a visual artist and a writer. And then me, and then we had Lisa Kalkowski. Uh, she is she lives in Finland since many years and is a German also. And she was a fantastic producer. And she also works as a teacher, and I think she had somehow also kind of a high background. At least she fit very well with the group. So, and this was really needed because there was a lot of logistics involved in this in this field tour. And then we had Celia Moberg. She is a Finnish uh, visual artist. Uh, can I say anything more? Mm. Yeah, you have uh, about Syria. But yeah, about Syria. She is, is she from Helsinki? I don't know. I anyway, yeah. She's so, from the vicinity of Helsinki. Yeah. <laughs> and then we had two geologist students. And this was a challenge for me because Sasha Macre, he's he by 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 accident, by chance, he is back he, his background is from the Netherlands, but he lives in Finland since many years. And Elisa Koski. Elisa Koski is a biology student, and uh, Sasha Macre is a student of geology. And they both participated really as as as, in a, as formal students, so they got credit points from the university, and this was like an official course, and that was a little bit challenging for all of us because we had to deliver something. The students had to learn something, and for both of them, it was the first field work in sedimentology and in doing stratigraphy and methods like that, and this was really an exceptional circumstance to work with artists and it really which is in a, in a environment which or how i would say in a yeah in a, in a, in a intellectual environment which is not university teaching and it was also not strict scientific research so and scientific methods so it was really a challenge but it was, was I, I was quite happy with, with this and then finally uh, erich was part of the group. So we were, what was it, eight people at the end, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say, for, for, for us, it's a typical group, actually. You know, mm -hmm. like you have artists, you have scientists, you have other practitioners and also students. For mm -hmm. us, it's not the first time mm -hmm. that it's actually, we really kind of uh, uh, like this very much. Also, the, the kind of uh, the intergenerational aspect here yeah. is, is very strong. So the, the age differs quite a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, also, what was maybe different is like two other field notes is that we we were working under pandemic conditions, so that's why we actually didn't make an open call because um, it would have been uh, just basically not really useful. Uh, but instead, basically, try to to find the the expertise by just kind of talking and discussing with people. Hmm. And before we went into the field, we had to do a little bit of kind of a homework. And one part of this homework was to get permits. And for me, this was also really to reflect on this and to think about these permits was really an interesting fact. Also, we had to go there. We had to we were not really clear where we went, where we would go. And some of the areas with the fossils really were in the middle of protected nature reservoirs. So usually people should not leave the, the paths there and they should not pick anything, any rocks or so. And for us, uh, it was really an interesting experience to, 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 to explain um, the people from, from Metsalitos and from the nature reservoirs to what we really want to do and also that we don't know exactly where we go and how many rocks we would pick and, and so on. So it was uh, really, it took some time. And then we studied the geological maps. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, I think the interesting thing maybe about the permits was also that partly the, the questions you needed to answer were very absurd, no? Mm -hmm. Like, which basically could not be answered, but it was somehow, like you can see there is a bureaucratic system mm -hmm. who is kind of trying to work, but has no clue what the practitioners on the field are actually doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was that was an interesting aspect, I think. And also to see how, if you take it serious, how this protection works. So uh, you cannot simply go in these areas and pick a rock or a stone, or so, even if it's just there are many rocks around, but they asked how many rocks do you want to take, how many kilograms or whatever. And um, so and then you think you, we started already thinking about what does it mean to protect such an area and what is our action, what are the consequences of our actions when we go there. And the people told us, yeah, you will step above some lichens. And we saw already that everything grows in the Arctic very slow and you can actually do some damage when you go in these protected mm -hmm. areas and pick in very sensible areas and turn a lot of rocks around and so on and so on. Yeah, and, and well, eventually we then basically just discarded the idea to go into protected areas. Mm -hmm. And as you just wanted to show the next slide, we then basically, we are looking for other places which are in reach. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we followed basically the blue. again the blue line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we planned the route. And this is just a photo of a topographical map. And here you can see again our, oops, is it visible? Yeah. We can see the field station on Zana here in the left corner. And then we walked basically, we decided we have to go in an area which is here. And that's a two days march. So that means two days going there and two days walking back and carrying all the stuff. And at some point we decided we need something to, we cannot carry the rocks and the sandals and all the food for our group for all this time when we stay there for a week. We could do that, but it would really like involve a lot of logistics to walk back and forth and so on. So we decided to hire a helicopter for that, which was not an easy decision, but uh, it went well then. So we went into this, we went to the place, stayed first in one hut, and then checked at this at the places if we could find uh, fossils and these were potential places so we didn't know if we really at all find anything in these areas um, but when we went then actually to to Kilpisiari, we organized our trip like that that we had the first week of arriving in Kilpisiari, make ourselves familiar with the area um, get to know each other and we had something like a seminar or a lecture series of really wonderful people who, who gave lectures to, to us um, and this is um, so like, it's all actually these were all the lectures given by by several people so we had a geologist from Tromsø University she talked about this Adiakaran time and about the time in this area and the geology of the area and then we had a... And can I say something yeah. to Annette actually? Yeah, yeah. Because Annette, we made contact already in 2013. We Antaro and me visited her mm -hmm. and she showed us these fantastic trace fossils from Digamuin Peninsula, yeah. which is basically the same sediment layer, but just in Norway. And uh, she gave us back then already kind of good advice on what to look for and, and, mm -hmm. and where to go. And then we... After that, we basically were able to identify the, the, the on, on Sana, the outcrop. But uh, Annette then was also one of the first ones which got pictures from our finds and was actually also really excited. And since then, she actually kind of stayed with the project and, and then came back for the lecture also. Yeah? I think it will also continue this collaboration. And the other person is Gabriela Mangano. She is uh, Argentine, from origin and from Argentine, is professor in, in Canada, paleontologist, and she's also very much interested in art and in cross, what is it, interdisciplinary approaches. And she gave us a talk about this, what we call the Cambrian explosion and uh, the, the role of trace fossils in the world. Also, 
with a political twist about the role of of what happens today at the ocean's floor with these huge trawling nets and destroying of the of the, the submarine fauna and so it was a very fascinating talk and then we had a talk by gis specialists so gis is a method to to map electronically to produce maps uh, an american with an archaeology background who lives now in Denmark and Copenhagen, and he just made us a little bit familiar with these tools, what we could do, how we could use um, geographic system, electronic systems mm. when we go in the field. But it also gave a perspective how, 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 how those people look at landscapes. Yeah. And then we had a, uh, a presentation and a lecture of Elizabeth McTurnan. She lives in Berlin and is originally from the US. And she is doing art, very, very fascinating, uh, develops strange tools to measure things and uh, to, to grasp, to quantify, mm. for instance, uh, the coastline. Yeah. And, and things like that. So she had a very unique approach to to, to grasp the, the scales, different scales, and to measure scales. And, and Liz was also already artist in residence uh, in, in Kilpisjärvi a couple of years ago, where she actually started to test out some of these ideas. Uh, she presented them, and so she was really a good match also to print this. In. Mm. Um, and then we had Jussi uh, Ehrenen, he is from Helsinki University and he is also actually by training a paleontologist, but now he works as a geographer and um, also in some kind of think tank. And so he's more politically in the geographical sense, actually. So mm. Also, he's teaching. And he's actually now running a, a research project at the Kipisjavi Biological Station, which uh, basically is looking in the time span, span of human activity 500 years past to 500 years future and Lena Valtiapa will be working together with him on that as well. <laughs> yeah and he's he's professor here in Helsinki and he gave us gave us a talk about this recent project and about the changes in the Arctic landscape. So we had a huge input, different very again very close multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and um, packed with this, then we could actually um, start and, and walk and go into the field. Yeah, and also during this week, we prepared ourselves not only like through discussions and, and with these presentations and other activities, but also we kind of um, developed individually or together certain protocols, either scientific protocols or artistic protocols, which we, which we would carry out in, in the field. And um, we actually have now two videos where we could, uh, where, we, where we show two of those kind of protocols. Yeah, and um, so if uh, you stop the screen mm -hmm. share. Mm -hmm. okay. So the first protocol is by Judith van der Elst and Jakob Besonen. And I have to now. Do 
you know, our, our walk from Kipisavi to here, when we did the footsteps, that we also, every time we were on a place where there was no imprint. Mm -hmm. And so it, it got us thinking a lot about the differences in the landscape. And I think we saw quite a bit of difference now when we see the landscape change and how dry it was now. That was a really good one. Yeah, I had a really good one. You. How did yours come? Yeah, and Judith, in a reflection of the work they uh, uh, and here I quote her, is saying that treading lightly as possible still begs the question, how will our behavior fossilize? What kind of materials do we impact in such a way that it will be preserved, like the trace fossils we are now boxing up? Will it lithify and be interpretable through the eye or turn into something else and what kind of interpretants will be able to detect those signs. There is no creation without destruction. What goes up must come down. Simple truth we believe in. The law of conservation alludes to this. There is no empty space for us to fill with new things, be it digital signals, boxes to store fossil specimens. Whenever we create something, something else is transformed, be it energy, mass or even information. This also makes the effort to preserve material in perpetuity in museums quite illusionary, taking it out of the cycle of matter when, sorry, something happened. Uh, taking it out of the cycle of matter when even preservation is transformation when you start to think of it. As we attempt to stop the aging process, we keep it in artificially climate controlled environments, stubbornly trying to retain it in a static state. So I, I now play the other video um, with uh, the field protocol of Pjörn and Elisa and uh, one second. It's not quite a TV studio here, so things don't go so smooth. Put it there. Yeah. So, yeah. find fragments of rocks, then it's sometimes difficult to understand what is the 
surface actually of a bedding surface. So when we look for fossils, we have to look at this beautiful. So this is a bedding. This is a bedding mm -hmm. surface. So, so this is like the horizontal in one mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. And this was created by the pressure mm -hmm. that yep. came later on, and then it shifted. I think in that case, like that, maybe in this direction. So, and sometimes, in some places, we will probably see cleavage, and because it's never the same, so the cleavage can be, it will, the angle will be no, no, nowhere the same. There, there might be places where the cleavage is parallel to the to the bedding, mm -hmm. and then it destroyed everything. But in that case, we have a little bit of luck that we sometimes get some surfaces. When we break this with a hammer, we can see is there anything in between. And that's where we look for the fossils. Spend like hours for connecting, but uh, What's that? A worm. A worm. What I think it? a worm. It's not cleavage. It's several worm traces. So there is some, some kind of pattern and this is also the place where, where the fossils are. Mm -hmm. And the very top of the cycles are always sand, silty sandstones. And they don't contain, at least the, the fossils are not very, uh, the trace fossils are not very beautifully yeah. preserved. Something like, a, what is it, how many meters is it? I think it's still the top so, of that one. Yeah, and it's a massive uh, rapid change, huh? Yeah, about that much. Yeah? yeah, a little bit more. <coughs> yeah? Yeah. Give it one thirty. You need to shine again. Mm -hmm. Now I'm switching. Now I'm switching to my screen again. Tuck, and uh, we are here. Okay, I just explain, explain a little bit because uh, I can also explain a little bit what we did there. Basically, we, we, we measured the sedimentological sections, the different beds there. The thickness of the beds, we tried to, to reach to, to measure them on the right angle and to interpret them what type of rocks they are, what type of traces we find. We found actually lots of traces, but in which uh, parts of this section. And this helps us at some point, uh, the paleontologists and the sedimentologists to understand under which circumstances these um, animals lived in that environment and also how it changed over time. Yeah? So this, what is it, how many meters? Was it 80 meters or something like that? That we measured, which is quite substantial. Probably, uh, who knows how many million years I ever, I never thought about how many million years this, this time interval represents. But um, yeah, so this is the usual work, which is my protocol usually when, when I go there. And that was also part of the teaching of the students, how I do that. And, um, so I sp we spent a lot of time, a whole day, I think, measuring this and, and looking for, for fossils in place. 
But this will help us then at some point to write a scientific paper about this. And this is, but this is only now one way to, 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 to look at these things. Yeah? So, and I think sometimes it's usually inadequate to really understand where we are, but it's nice also sometimes to, to concentrate and to, to focus on really, really uh, one thing. And um, yeah, I think that's everything I want to say about this, uh, the protocol, what we did in the field, but now we should come back to the traces a little bit. And this is just to show a little bit the, the, um, the diversity of what we found. We did not only find uh, tractitionals, but all kinds of very strange pattern. Yeah? In the upper left here, for instance, very strange. There are these dots and then traces going out. Another day, it looks almost like, a, I don't know what. <laughs> so we don't know. We have to know what we have to understand. We probably will cut one piece and not this one, but to understand what these animals did here. And then we have a huge, we found a huge surface with a mess of movements of roams and uh, uh, arthropods, what kind of all kinds of animals. Also, something we have to interpret at some point and to analyze. We can quantify many of those things, I think. And then we find we found ripple marks. So this is this is basically also the surface of an old 500 million years old uh, ocean surface, and these small ripples. They tell us the water was quite shallow there. It was not really a deep environment, and it was there was quite movement. And then we found these strange fossils here. We still have to understand what they are. Small worms and but quantification and, 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 and so digitization and drawings and measurements will help to get a little bit a better clue at some point. Yeah. But this is like the, the scientific method. And um, to do to further work on that, we packed our material. We packed the samples, I told already, we took them into the, to the helicopter, brought them to Kilpisier, we, we cleaned them in Kilpisier, we took all together, talked about our findings in Kilpisier, we had a little time and to show each other what we found and what we saw. And then we packed them into boxes, put them in the bus. And now they are in Helsinki, in the, uh, Kumpula Botanical Garden and the geological collections, and they are inventorized already. And they can now be used by the public, by everyone, not only by us, by everyone who asks and who can use this, the museum like a library. And so they are public, in a way, now public uh, property. Yeah. Yeah. And what else has happened? Uh, yeah. There was a considerable amount of post production, mm. like. Um, not only did we go through the material already on site together, but um, we also produced now some videos. Um, we uh, started also now monthly meetings with the group uh, uh, again. And now, uh, unfortunately for the moment on, on video, but uh, we hope that we come uh, together again and working towards what could possibly be an exhibition and also a publication. But um, we will see how that turns out into the, during the coming month. Yeah, and um, this is actually also part of, of the challenge now. Yeah? What, what, if there is anything, but I think already our tour, we learned, at least I learned a lot and my expectations, um, yeah, I was wrong in many, many things. So at the beginning and um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what I thought, how, how that could be, how what it would be. And uh, so it was, not, it was important also that it was a great, it was great fun yeah, for all of us. Mm. I think, uh, I, I don't know, I, I heard you the, this first, for the first time saying you were wrong, <laughs> but I think that what was really actually nice in with, with the group that, being wrong was not a category. Absolutely. No, there, yeah, there, yeah. Was, there was a, a lot of generosity yeah. in different opinions. And I think we had really good discussions uh, as, like about some very difficult things also. Like, for example, you know, the, like the ownership of the samples and things like that. But maybe we can 
uh, now turn the presentation off and, and go back to, to Hanna Rika and the audience and discuss with them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Stop.